Today on Family Vision, toddler training basics. Join us for this important conversation. Rob Reno here alongside my amazing wife, Amy. It's great to be here again. Well, today is toddler training basics. Now, most of the time on Family Vision, when it comes to parenting, especially parenting littles, we are going to focus on heart connection, spiritual training, family worship. Uh, But today we're going to be talking about practical behavioral issues, behavior challenges, and training. Well, part of the you know, when we started this whole podcast with Family Vision, we're at a different stage in our life. We have older kids. So those are the things that we're dealing with on a regular basis. Our youngest is nine. Yeah, exactly. But when we're traveling and we're speaking with families, I'm usually answering a lot of questions and working with moms with little kids. All right, sweetie, I want you to start off and talk about this research on boundaries, on actual physical boundaries that they did out on the playground, because I think it helps set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Yes. I mean, when I was um, getting my master's degree at Wheaton College in marriage and family therapy, there was a study that my professor referenced about, well, it was a sociological study that basically showed that on a playground where there was no fence, children tended to clump together more in the middle, you know, in around the playground equipment, and they would stay in a they would use like a smaller radius. However, if there was a playground with a fence, wherever you know the whole space up to the fence, there would be more freedom within that area. The and so would fill the, the kids would area. fill the fenced area. Now, my professor wasn't sharing that with me based on toddler training. I wasn't a mom then, I wasn't thinking about this study. But when I became a parent, that illustration helped me so much because I realized that my job as a mom was to always be figuring out where was I going to put the fence? Where did the fence need to be? And so the fence would have to grow, not just with the age of my child, but how well my child was operating in the given boundary I'd given them. Like I didn't, you can't change the boundary until you know that the first boundary has been internalized, if that makes sense. Let me give a really practical example. Most of us understand what it's like when a little kid is going towards an outlet, right? And putting their finger toward an outlet. And we might do something, maybe even like for me, I might even slap their hand on or and say danger because I want the baby or the child to know that that is danger. Um, but if you, the the fence in that situation would be to protect all the outlets in your house. And if you, that's your boundary, that's your fence. And the reason why I'm protecting all those outlets completely is so that the child, I don't have to, I, I've created a safe space. So that child can be in that area, the outlets are covered, And I know that the child is safe. I'm not really working on training at that point to teach them that the outlet is dangerous, but I'm protecting them by putting an appropriate fence up. And I'm not going to move that fence or I'm not going to take any of those plugs out until I'm 100% sure that the child knows that that is dangerous and you shouldn't put your finger there. Now, there are some parents, and I can remember, the reason I probably go to this outlet story a lot is because some parents actually my parents, would tell me the story all the time of my brother who would, you know, always reach for the outlet and have his hand slapped and keep reaching the outlet and have his hand slapped and have his hand slapped, you know, and the their whole idea was like, well, that's such an example that he was so strong-willed. You know, and in reality, that's just an example that he's not ready to have be around an outlet without a cover. Does that make sense? Because the child hasn't internalize the boundary yet. So if you have to constantly redirect a kid and constantly tell them, no, 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 that means that they're not ready for Mm. that boundary. Does that make sense? Yeah, Yeah, it does. All right, I want to talk about a hypothetical uh, toddler case here. Yeah. Let's call the parents Rob and Amy. Okay. Just to choose names. (laughs) And this hypothetical couple was in church. They had a two-year-old, call him RW. They had a baby named Lissy. And why don't you continue? Well, I can kind of remember the emotion of this Hi- interaction, this, this hypothetical case study. case study. But classically, we I don't know why we were in a church service. I don't know if RW 
couldn't be in the nursery. I don't know what the situation was, but we were up in the balcony with our two-year-old and our six-month-old, and our Debbie was starting to, um, you know, I have like a snack or something to appease him a little bit, but he's starting to want to get out of his seat. And there's like people sitting in front of us and people sitting behind us. So our Debbie's trying to get out of his seat. And Rob is like, I got to get our W out of the seat. I'm like, no, we can't get out of the seat. He's like, I want to get our W out of the seat. I'm like, you cannot take him out of the seat. You know what I mean? And so we're having one of these like whisper arguments in the pew, which like I honestly t- embarrassed to this day when I think about it because here's like the- Was it that level of it was, well, public it was, shame? It was getting heated in that whisper tone. You know what I mean? What you're trying. It was a whisper fight? It was a whisper fight. In church. Heated in church between the youth pastor and his wife. And yeah, I can still. Nobody knows. I Nobody's can still talking. remember the emotion because I was so frustrated that you wanted to get him out of the seat. The reason why I, I, I knew that I only had two choices. Either you keep RW in the seat and you engage him in the seat or you leave the service with him. But. That's choice A, leaving the services Why can't choice you kind B. Of roam around but a Rob little. wanted to get him out of the seat and like just let him walk up and down the steps or whatever over here on the side. And like you're just well, gonna supervision. Um, but you're just gonna unleash a bigger problem. And that's what the argument was about. I'm like, these are the Solving boundaries, the these are the rules. See, yeah, that's the thing. So here's my point. As a mom, especially with two year olds, you have to go in to certain situations, right, knowing what your boundary is. Now, granted, we learn these things by trial and error. Like, so in your defense, you probably hadn't spent as much time with RWs. I had to know that, that, you know, I knew that I could keep him seated and keep him engaged there as best as I can. And then when we were, when he was done, like he needed to know that, when we're in church, we're sitting. This is what we're doing. We're not running up and down the, or, you know, walking up and down the steps in the balcony. Like that's that was where the boundary is. In church, we're sitting. There might be whispering. There might be playing with little toys. There might be having a snack. But the boundary is that's what we do here. And then, or we leave the service. We leave the sanctuary. But we're not going to, you right. know, play up and down on the steps. Does that make sense? So you were probably wise with that. But it was just. It's an example. I think a lot of parents, we, you know, it's like, oh, my kid, you know, needs to move, or you know what I mean. They, they're, they think they're solving a problem, but they're actually creating a bigger one, sure. because having him roam up and down the steps was going to be a bigger problem, not a, a solution to a problem. It does remind me of a famous church story. I'm sure, I've shared it on Family Vision before, but I love it so much. I'll share it again. So one of our children was uh, less than one years old. I don't exactly remember. And we're in church and the baby starts making fussing noises. And of course, you're in the pew or the seat and you're trying to quiet your child so you're not disturbing others. And uh, But baby's getting uh, noisier. So I stand up. Now I'm standing up off the side of the sanctuary, kind of rocking the kid. And, and I get maybe a minute or two of quiet out of the child. But then they are ramping up again. So we go to DEFCON 3. I move to the back of the sanctuary where there's some other parents doing the exact same thing. They have a child in their arms, rocking, doing the back and forth. And um, uh, another, I, in particular, a woman was there with her baby. And uh, her baby starts making too much noise. She's like, I'm out of here. She goes to the cry room and my baby starts making too much noise. I say, I can't stay. I go to the cry room. So now we're all in the cry room and they have the the service on the video screen in the cry room. So everybody's trying to watch church in the cry room. And this woman's child begins to make lots of noise in the cry room, making it harder to hear the service on the TV. And she gets all flustered and gets up to leave because her child is disturbing the people in the cry room. And I just said to her, I'm like, where are you going? You know what I mean? Like, this is it. This is the bottom of the barrel. There's nowhere else to go. It's okay that your child cries here. I just remember that. I still laugh about it. It is true. There became another dynamic in the cry room. I totally remember those days. All right, let's do another well, uh, me, case study here. Yes. Well, another example. I was just going through this with – this sounds like silly examples, but it's helpful to get your plan before you're in certain situations. And one of them is just the stroller. You know, I don't – I see – um a lot of situations where a child, you know, you're, you you want to go for a walk in the stroller or you need to get somewhere and your child doesn't want to be in the stroller. And they're fighting you and, 
you know, they're pushing back on their t- that they want to be in the stroller. And they're buckled in. And the buckles are there for a reason. I highly recommend that you use the buckles when you have a toddler. But I've seen this happen in many times where, you know, you're, the child, the parent just like, oh, I feel bad for my kid because they want to get out of the stroller. So they make the fundamental flaw of getting the child out of the stroller. Um, and then they're dealing with a situation where, you know, whether they're on a walk or whether you're in the store or whatever it is, where now you're dealing with a child is, who's running around and you're trying to usually, especially if you have another baby that you're taking care of, you've got a toddler that just is now into more problems. Again, it's kind of like you, instead of knowing when, for the mom deciding, when is it a good time for the child to get out of the stroller versus when the child wants to decide to get out of the stroller. And I know this sounds like basic, but it actually is very helpful to kind of process these things because again, you learn by trial and error. But the boundaries that I'm trying to help young moms with is that you as the mom decide when it is a good time for your kid child to be in the stroller and when it's a good time for your child to be out of the stroller. And there might be things that you can use like snacks or toys or whatever to keep them appeased. But at the end of the day, you know that you've made the decision when, you know, your decision of when they're going to be in the stroller or not in the stroller isn't based on whether the kid wants to be there or not. I can distinctively remember Oh, my goodness, the amount of times I went through the airports with a child screaming in a stroller because they were (laughs) – it's really fun. Um, Not be – you know, just because I knew that that was the safest place for the child to be and it was the only way that I could manage everything I had to manage. So it's okay to put your child in a situation where they're upset or they don't want to be there. You need to be the one – in the driver's seat, and you need to be the one again deciding when it's a good time to get out and when it's right. the time to be in, and not letting that be directed by whether or not your child wants to be in the stroller or not. Yeah. I remember something that we heard in a seminar from S.M. Davis talking about the parent being the parent yes. and that it was loving and necessary for the parent to be in charge. And he was talking about these situations, just like these case studies Amy's given, where the parent is saying no, the parent is setting a boundary. And he said, the parent must always win. Right. I'm listening to this guy. I'm like, I like this. (laughs) Keep going. I was more shocked. And then point two was the parent must always be gentle. I'm like, oh, rats. I never forgot that because uh, as important as the rules are, both for the parent and Mm -hmm. for the child, the spirit uh, with which they're enforced is also essential. So easier said than done, I know, but we need to ask God to help us both have a firm hand and a a gentle heart. And let me just say with that, when I first heard that the parent must always win, that sounded so, you know, almost harsh to me. Like, well, that can't be... Right, like the parent can't always win. But let me just explain when I really got that principle, how that affected my parenting. So remember what I said a couple times that we figure out these things by trial and error. Nobody knows as a parent exactly where the boundary should be. And it's usually when you get in the situations and have the problems that you learn where to set the boundaries. You learn as you go. That's understandable. But what that helped me with was when um, the parent must always win. So go, let, going back to my stroller example, let's say if I t- told my my um, child that we're going to go for a walk and you need to be in the stroller, and halfway through the walk, I realize I kind of have the space and capacity that, okay, this is a good time. I could let them out. I could... Um, you know, give, I can, I feel like I can manage them out of the stroller now. I could do this. I can say something like, they might be fussing to get out of the stroller, but I was like, mom, I would always say, mommy changed her mind. Mommy's decided it's okay that you can get out Mm. here. It's just, it was such a little communication but thing, but it made a difference because I was clearly telling my kids, I have decided to do something different. And that just gives them, again, 
that understanding that it's mom the one making these decisions. I'm not making this decision because you're demanding to get out of the stroller. I'm making the decision because I've changed my mind and I think now this is a safe place and we can do this now and I can watch you. So that is just a helpful, and yeah, I really got great. that from SM Davis of just how I was speaking to my kids. Okay, one more thing. Mm -hmm. I know we're talking about setting boundaries, saying no, but as we were getting ready for this episode, I really yeah. appreciated what you talked about when it came to positive training and positive yeah. teaching. It's not just the kid wants to do A and you're saying right. no, but that you can actually do positive training. Can you give some examples? Yes, I'd always, you know, I think it's good at, especially in these toddler ages, to set simple goals and things that you are working towards in this age. Like I'm calling it toddler, but basically by the time they're walking mobile till what, two, two and a half before they're really verbal, that kind of time frame. And there's some simple training goals that you really want to accomplish. And one of them is having them come to you when you call their, when you call their name that they would come to you. That is one that you know takes a while for kids to learn and you need to be patient in training them, but that is a super important skill. So that's something you can start working on your kids with your kids right away, whether they're very verbal or not. Um, you know, my kids varied in how early they spoke, but you know, they can understand their name and coming when they're called. So training them positively in that is super helpful. Like even practicing it? Oh, yeah. We'd practice that a lot. You, we would just, you know, and it wasn't just practice. As the more kids I had, it was not just coming when mommy calls them. It was coming when their siblings calling them. You know what I mean? Other, you know, there are other family members too, but really training them in that skill because that is important safety skill. When you think about these years, safety is a huge, huge factor. But I don't know what teacher said this to me, but it was so helpful to use the word danger. So if a child ran into the street, I would not say no, I would say danger. And I would say danger very firmly, you know, and that would be a situation where I might give them a spanking on the bottom because I really was trying to distinguish, you know, you say no for lots of things, but I was saving the word and teaching them that danger meant another level. Like I really wanted to understand them to understand danger. Well, a scripture that I was reading even this morning on this subject, Proverbs 29, 17 says, discipline your son and he will give you rest. He mm -hmm. will give delight to your heart. So if we take the root of that short term win, I'm back in the sanctuary in the balcony, right? My little two-year-old's driving me nuts. I just want to let him out of his seat because he's driving me crazy. That, that short-term win for me, um, it's going to be a long-term loss. So if our children are throwing tantrums and getting what they want, we're going to get more tantrums. We're not going to get what Proverbs 2019 says. It says we're not going to get rest and delight from our child. We're going to get work and misery from them. Well, and you said something too that was really important there. You said he was driving me crazy. You have to understand as a parent that you have to know what your level of tolerance is. And that's different between mm -hmm. different person parents and different personality styles. For example, in our home, I can handle lots of noise. It really doesn't bother me at all. So my kids can make lots of noise and I'm not going to be flustered or frustrated or that doesn't push my buttons. But that really pushes mm -hmm. Rob's buttons. Um, another really helpful example is when you as a mom have to do other things, like you have to cook dinner, you have to make phone calls, you have to, um, you know, you have an agenda of things that you have to get done every single day. Well, what level can you handle, you know, with your toddler without losing your temper? What's going to drive you crazy? You have to figure that out yourself. So for me, I can remember in our big family room, I had, we bought like the biggest child safety gate you ever saw. It was like, it covered the whole room and it enclosed. Well, we had a big opening. We had, we had a seal. huge opening, but, and I, and I had a house where my family room was really not close to my kitchen. Like most homes today, it's all together. But if I had to cook, I really couldn't see what was going on. So I had to have this big safety gate and I had everything child proofed in that room. You know, and I could put our W and Lissy in there and I could cook and I could know that they would be safe. And yes, I would even turn on the television and just to keep things safe because I that's what I needed. 
in order to accomplish what I needed to get done without losing my temper or being, you know, frustrated with them and getting overly distracted. That's what I needed. Now, I had a girlfriend who thought she— Well, they were only in there seven or eight hours. Stop, I mean, it's... stop. She mocked me for that game. I mean, lovingly. She was a good friend. But she did not parent that way. I mean, she would never put a big gate up for her kids in their house. And she would rather cook and, you know, chase toddlers all at the same time. I cannot operate that like and that. And she was losing her mind. She, well— you know, I was, but yes, so sometimes I mean, she was. But the point is, getting frustrated, getting, getting frustrated. upset in Lo- the chaos. Correct. I just want to encourage you that losing your temper, losing your cool, and you know, if you're consistently doing that, change your boundaries because that's going to cause more damage for your toddler. If you're getting angry with them, um, that's going to do more heart connection damage. Mm. And we really want to you know, create an environment in our home, an environment where we're out, where we we know the boundaries and we know the boundaries based on what we can handle. And what you can handle may be very different than what your best friend can handle. And that is totally okay. We'd love to help you develop a practical game plan for helping your kids grow in character, grow in faith, Uh, create this kind of family that's filled with rest and delight. All of our families are falling short, uh, but God's got such good plans for us. And that's what our Visionary Parenting book and video Bible study is all about. You can get a copy of Visionary Parenting on our website at visionaryfam.com or wherever you buy your books. And we would love to see you in person in the coming weeks. March 18th, we have two events. We are dividing and conquering. I am back in Seattle speaking at the Northwest Ministry Conference, and you and our daughter, Lissy, mom to our granddaughter, Avi, you're going to be doing a special event for moms and daughters together at Wheaton Academy in West Chicago, Illinois, that Saturday morning, 9 to 1030. It's for moms and daughters to come to strengthen your relationship together and learn how to grow in faith together. And Lissy was our strong-willed two-year-old daughter. So for us to be doing a mother-daughter seminar, that's a quite a testimony yeah. in and of itself. So if you want to hear more about that, please come. Info for all those events at visionaryfam.com. And if today's episode was helpful for you, we'd love it if you would share it with a friend, leave a rating, leave a review, and send us your comments, your questions, your prayer needs at podcast at visionaryfam.com. And we look forward to our next time with you on Family Vision. It means so much to us to have you be a part of the Family Vision community. If this episode was meaningful for you, would you share it with a friend, with a family member? You can actually partner with us to bring hope and help to families around the world. We are praying that Family Vision is a blessing to you and your family. So thank you for joining us here. We look forward to our next time together.